The Nicene Creed, Part 2, The Son. The Nicene Creed is divided into three parts, one part for each member of the Trinity. See my last video about the Father. This article is about the origin and life of Jesus and how he is truly God. Wait a minute! Oh, here we go again. The Bible doesn't say Jesus is God. Well, actually it does, but that reminds me. These next few phrases are pretty theologically dense, but we have to be thorough or else it really won't make any sense. So, are you ready? Here we go. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. We say Jesus is Lord because Jesus himself affirms this title in John 13, 13, and the only begotten Son because, you know, John 3, 16, to name one example. So far, so good. But for this next bit, we're going to need some historical context. It's important to note that the Nicene Creed was written during the Arian Controversy. What's the Arian Controversy, you ask? Well, the simple answer is that much of the church at this time was following the teachings of a guy named Arius, who taught that Jesus wasn't God. Except, that's a drastic oversimplification. You see, it wasn't like Arius didn't know about John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The controversy was more over the relationship between the Father and the Son. Arius argues that fathers have to exist before their sons, and therefore sons are kind of like creations of their fathers. So there must have been a time when God the Father existed, but the Son didn't yet. Sounds reasonable, right? Except there's some huge issues with that. You see, when a human father begets a son, he passes on all the inherent qualities of being human, like being finite, mortal, and having a beginning. When God begets a son, he passes on all the inherent qualities of being God, like being infinite, immortal, and having no beginning or end. So if the Father has always existed, the Son has also always existed. But where is all this in the Bible? Hold on, we're getting there. We've already talked about how Jesus is begotten, but what about his eternality? In John 1-2 it says, He was in the beginning with God. And in Revelation 22, 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And 2 Timothy 1, 9 says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Christ Jesus would have had to be there before the ages began if he was giving us grace in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So, the creed continues, begotten of his Father before all ages. Then it goes, God of God, light of light, true God of true God. What's that about? Well, remember, if God begets a son, that son must also be God. Okay, but what about this light of light thing? Well, the Bible says that God is a light to his people, like in Isaiah 60, verse 9, which says, the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. But Jesus also claims this in John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. So, God, who is light, begets God, who is also light. True God of true God. Is Jesus true God? Well, yes, John 1, 5, 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Begotten, not made. There's a difference between being begotten of God and being created by God. If you were begotten of God, you are inherently equal with God. But if you were a creation of God, then you are subordinate to him because a creature is not greater than its creator. This is boring! Yeah, I know, but we had to hash out all the details because there are a lot of people out there today claiming to be Christians and yet deny the full divinity of the Son. So we need to be fully prepared to give an answer for what we believe and why we believe it if we're going to be competent evangelists. It's almost like we need a creed. So anyway, there's still one more part of the Arian controversy we have to cover. Homoousius or Homoousius? He's speaking in tongues! No, it's just Greek, and it's actually simpler than it sounds. The question is, does Jesus have the same substance as the Father, Homoousius, or a similar substance, Homoousius? Who cares? Well, it's actually super important, because if Jesus is of a similar substance and not the same substance, then he's not fully God, and therefore Christians actually worship two gods which goes against what we just said in the first article about believing in one God. Okay, but does the Bible talk about this? Yep, go back to John 1, 1, which says the Word was with God. This is why the Creed says he is consubstantial with the Father, or as some translations go, being of one substance with the Father. Also see John chapter 10, which goes into more detail about the oneness of the Father and the Son. Okay, did you survive that? It gets easier from here, I promise. Next it says, through whom all things were made. 
It says that because that's literally what John 1, 3 says. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven? It says Jesus came down from heaven because Jesus claimed this in John 6, 38. And it says for our salvation because, you know, that's like his whole thing. This next part is the story of Jesus' earthly life. and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. Wait, what does that mean? Well, it just means that the miracle of the Word of God becoming a human being was done by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the angel tells Mary in Luke 1.35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered, and was buried. All four gospel accounts say that Pilate was the governor that sentenced Jesus to death. This is actually the one part of the story that skeptics can't deny, because we have Roman records that mention Pilate. The third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. I think it's pretty obvious where this comes from too, but I want to make a quick note about the whole in accordance with the scriptures thing. That part is actually a carryover from an earlier creed known as the Corinthian Creed, which Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15.3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Mark 16, 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. Again, this is pretty obvious to anyone who's read the New Testament, but here's Acts 10, 42, just to make the point. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Yes, there's even a Bible verse about his kingdom not having an end. Luke 1, 32-33 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Homo... Oh boy. Homo... Homo... Homoousius. Homoousius. 